Hi everyone, it's 10 o'clock. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to start the webinar. I'm Katie Lund. I'm Circa's Director of Engagement. Um, I'll be moderating this hour webinar, which focuses on regional resilience planning for, uh, for the protection of public drinking water. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from three speakers who have a state and regional perspective on this topic. Um, just a few things in terms of the intro first before turning it over to them. Uh, this webinar is part of a monthly Resilient Connecticut webinar series that Circa is offering along with partners in the state like the ones that are going to be presenting today. Uh, you can find out more about the Resilient Connecticut project by um, going to this website, resilientconnecticut.ucon.edu. And here you can sign up to receive our monthly resilience roundup newsletter and check in on um, announcements and events like this. So today we are fortunate to have three speakers, including Stephen Wallet from the Department of Public Health, uh, Pro Professor Christine Kirchhoff, who is in UConn's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. We also have John Hudak on the line, um, the Environmental Planning Manager for the South uh, South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority. So those are going to be the um, three speakers today. But I also want to um, mention that Rebecca Andreucci, who is the regional planner for the South Central Regional Council of Governments, is also on the line. And that's because the COG applied um, and received one of Circa's Municipal Resilience Grant, um, which is contributing to some of the information that you'll hear today. So Rebecca um, has agreed to be on the line in case people have questions, uh, you know, for the COG, um, which we can get to at the end of, at the end of the webinar. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping items for all of you that are participating. The webinar is actually being recorded and we'll post it online so you can um, share it with colleagues that you might also think are interested in the topic. Um, all of all the attendees have your audio muted, but you can use a chat box, which you should see in the lower right of your screen, to ask questions. Um, if you don't see the chat box, then you just need to click on the chat icon, which is in the lower part of your screen. So we'll try and save 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for your questions, and I'll do my best to track them and facilitate responses with the speakers today. Um, so let's start by hearing from Stephen, um, who's going to present on the state's uh, new drinking water vulnerability assessment and resilience plan, which was done in partnership with researchers um, at UConn, some Circa staff, and Malone and McBroom. So Stephen, I have your slides up, and you can take it from here. Thank you, Katie. Please let me know if anybody has uh, difficulty hearing me. I'll try to speak up. You sound great, thanks. Thanks. Next slide. Here are a few of our primary responsibilities. We regulate over 2,500 public water systems, including over 500 community water systems. 2.8 million Connecticut residents are served by public water. Next slide. The drinking water section is the primacy agency for the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, so we are the primary parties responsible for implementing the groundwater rule, the revised total coliform rule, lead and copper rule, and so on. We have a staff of about 50 scientists and engineers that provide technical assistance to public water systems. The funding for this project came from a community development block grant administered by the Department of Public, uh, the, sorry, the Connecticut Department of Housing. While this project was specific to the four coastal counties, it is scalable to encompass the entire state. Next slide. Why did Connecticut do a drinking water vulnerability assessment and resiliency plan? Many drinking water systems in Connecticut were directly impacted by recent storms. Some smaller communities were without adequate water for extended periods. The time it took to return, return to normal service 
was measured in weeks for some areas. Simply put, vulnerabilities in our state's drinking water systems were exposed during these events. I wanted to mention that vulnerabilities in how we as an agency respond to these emergencies were also identified. We experienced difficulties in communicating with many of our staff, which were snowed in and cut off from resources that are available only in the office. The state has already taken steps to reduce these vulnerabilities by introducing new regulations, such as the new generator regulations, the asset management requirements for small community water systems, We've also implemented a streamlined drinking water state revolving fund loan program for generators. And also we are working on making resources available to staff from remote locations. Next slide. In 2016, we entered into the agreement with Circa the plan objective is to be better prepared and resilient before, during, and after future storms and hazards by assessing, identifying, and addressing vulnerabilities. Again, the, the plan was specific to the four coastal counties, but again, this is scalable to the whole state. Next slide. The plan consisted of four tasks. Each task concluded with a specific deliverable that we will use to help guide future efforts on resiliency. I think it's important to mention that these tasks incorporated a significant amount of empirical evidence collected during the early stages of the project. We shared a considerable amount of data with Circa and MMI. Circa surveyed local health departments, COGS, and community water systems. They also interviewed key members of our staff and staff from other states. I want to thank all the parties that participated. Your contributions were essential to the success of this project. I also want to point out that this is a drinking water plan and includes a task, task number three, dedicated to private wells. Ryan Tatro and Tiziana Shea from the Department of Public Health Private Well Program made significant contributions to this plan and to the project. Next slide. The plan was fully executed in December of 2016. The final deliverables were drafted late last year. The plan can be found on our website. There's a link there on the screen, uh, but please let me know if you need any help uh, finding the, the report or any of the documents that I'm referring to. If you can't find time to read all 400 plus pages of the plan and the appendices, I highly recommend that you read the executive summary. The plan is part of a roadmap to assist all small water systems throughout Connecticut prepare for future disasters and events and help foster relationships between the smaller systems and the more resilient larger water systems. As I mentioned earlier, this is a working document. We will continue to develop resources based on the strategies outlined in this plan. This plan is a great complement to other recent initiatives, including the Water Utility Coordinating Committee's integrated reports and the Connecticut State Water Plan. Links to these reports can be found on our website. If you have any questions, please let me know. And thank you very much for letting me participate. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm passing the uh, controls over to Christine, and, and while uh, she gets her screen up, I just want to point out that that link that Stephen mentioned in um, his slides, we'll, we'll definitely share that with all of you um, in, in an email that goes to all the registrants for the webinar. So if you didn't get that long link, don't worry. We'll, um, we'll include it in a message going out along with the, uh, the video, and the, um, we'll put it on the website about the event too. So I just want to assure people that 
you will be able to get that information if you don't know where it is already. So thank you, Stephen. And um, if people do have questions for Stephen, we'll um, take all the questions at the end. But again, feel free to use that chat box in your, in your lower right-hand screen. Uh, Christine, you should have the controls now if you want to just share your slides with everyone. Yep, let me see if I can share. And, and thanks everyone go. for being patient. We're all, um, we can see your slides now, Christine. We're all uh, in remote locations on a sunny summer Friday. So, so um, <laughs> appreciate your patience as we just get some of these slides loaded up. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Katie. And um, pleasure to be part of this webinar with such a great group of folks. Um, so my section of the presentation is about uh, preparing for a changing climate in Connecticut. So I want to cover a few key question topics. The so three noted here. The first, really focusing on the climate trends and future climate changes that we expect. And of course, focusing on those changes that would be of interest to water managers. So mostly thinking there about uh, flooding and drought. The second, is about um, how extreme storms and droughts have impacted water systems. And so Steve uh, gave us a broad view of those impacts. And so this will dig in a little bit deeper using the surveys and interviews that he mentioned. And we'll also talk a bit about how systems have responded. And then finally cover some uh, information about how systems can think about preparing for future changes. And just as a reminder, uh, Stephen, presented a good overview of um, that larger project that was a, a collaboration between DPH, Melinda McBroom, the region, uh, and CIRCA. Another project that uh, Katie mentioned with the Regional Water Authority and the COG. Uh, and then there's still a third project uh, that was a collaboration with uh, CIRCA and that project focused on climate change impacts for the state of Connecticut, and that was with Dr. Wing, Dr. Seth, uh, and Dr. Anya. And so I want to make sure that I acknowledge um, all of the individuals that contributed to uh, this work. All right, and so with each question, I'll briefly mention the methods and then discuss briefly the findings. All right, so let's talk first about climate trends and future climate. Again, this work is drawing on the work of three uh, University of Connecticut colleagues, Dr. Wing, Dr. Seth, and Dr. Anya. Uh, Dr. Wing was primarily responsible for the precipitation um, analysis of trends and in future projections, including uh, linking to hydrology. Dr. Seth and Anya focused most on the temperature uh, trends and projections. So in thinking about the methods uh, for looking at the historical climate, so this is again looking at um, past rec records, weather station data from Global Historical Climatology Network, National Climatic Data Center, and then four and six kilometer gridded observations based on the MET data and LIVNED et al. data uh, that span the periods from 1980 to 2017 and from 1950 to 2013. So there's a lot of data um, that went into this examination of historical climate to derive trends in temperature and precipitation for the state. So looking at that historical record um, from the 1900s, so just the turn of the century to 2015, what we're seeing over that 100-year-plus um, period is an annual increase roughly of about 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit per decade with the greatest warming in winter. And so what does that translate into? Roughly, if we think about back in the turn of the century, the 1900s, the annual average temperature for the year was about 47 degrees. Now it's closer to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then that warming in winter means that back in the 1900s, there was about 26 degree on average in the winter. And now we're closer to about 30 degree Fahrenheit in the winter. On the precipitation side of things, <clears throat> looking since the 1950s, annual precipitation has increased by about more than two inches across the state, again, on an annual average basis. 
when you dig into that, most of that increase is due to increases in summer precipitation. And so the two figures on the bottom here on the left is the change in annual average precipitation from a reference period, 1950 to 1979, compared to a more recent uh, period, 30-year period, 1980 to 2009. And then on the right, you're looking at that summer average for the same two periods. And do pay attention to the scale on the left. It's from zero to four inches. On the right, zero to two inches. And so you can see that annual average or some variation from about one to four inches um, on average two. And then on the right, you see there's some variation from about one to two inches. The hatch areas are uh, indicate um, a lack of agreement. So we're not able to stay, stay with um, confidence that there was a measurable change there, but the areas that are not hatched show measurable change in precipitation. So turning now from the historical to future climate, <clears throat> we look at future climate based on assumptions about what the future will hold. Scenarios help us to imagine what different futures might look like. For climate projection, scientists typically use what are known as representative concentration pathways. So if you've heard of RCPs, that stands for the representative concentration pathways. And these pathways present different or paint different pictures about what future um, global development will look like in terms of uh, potential warming. For this project, uh, in particular for the precipitation projections and for the temperature projections, Dr. Wang, Seth, and Anya focused on the RCP 8.5. This is considered a high emissions scenario uh, pathway, but in fact, when you look at our recent um, projections for uh, emissions and warming, they closely track RCP 8.5, which is this business as usual scenario. The projections for future climate are based on differences between the reference period 1970 to 1999 compared to mid-century defined as 2040 to 2060. As you probably know, the best tools for projecting future climate that we have available for us now are 3D numerical global climate models known as GCMs, but those global climate models are quite coarse in resolution on the order of 100 to 300 kilometers. So to accommodate the kinds of local level analysis that we are interested in for Connecticut, that 100 to 300 does us no good. So we need some kind of means of downscaling information to some resolution that would be more appropriate. So this is either done through dynamical downscaling or statistical downscaling for this project. We use statistical downscale, multimodal climate projections applied to daily output from the latest generation climate models, which are CMIP-5s. And so we used, relied on a couple of different data sets, uh, most often the multivariate adaptive constructive analog, known as MACA for short, and the associated MET data, which is a gridded um, observational data set, which is used as a reference period. So the last thing to mention is that while MACA includes all 20 downscale GCMs, uh, Anya, uh, Guiling, Wang, and um, Angie Seth focused on eight global climate models that represent the full range of uncertainty in climate sensitivity for Connecticut and that their overall performance for simulating the present day climate for Connecticut um, were superior to the others. And so it was a careful uh, determination of which global climate models made the most sense to use in the analysis. All right, with that, what what did we find? What did they find? So changes in drought risks. So these were um, calculated based on the difference between precipitation and potential evapotranspiration. So as the temperature warms, while we might see increases in precipitation, as we've seen in trends uh, over the past 50 years, it may be compensated by increases in evapotranspiration driven by warming. We were looking at low seasonal annual and two-year precipitation periods with returns of 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. So what did we see in terms of finding is that, again, as I mentioned, despite this increase in annual rain, which we've reported since the 1950s, we've seen historically since the 1950s, we expect 
that will likely uh, continue, and I'll talk about that in a moment with the flooding risk. But the rising in temp rise in temperatures means that they, we're still going to see these severe summer droughts, and in fact, they're likely to become more frequent. But just to give a sort of a sense of what that might look like, past droughts that were experienced once every 20 years are likely to recur every three to 10 years. And one limitation of the study was we really wanted to look at the 1960s drought, uh, given that's such an important um, occurrence for water planning in the state. That drought is comparable to a 125-year drought. Uh, it was driven by about a decade of low pre precipitation. That kind of event may be less common in the future, given the rise in um, annual average precipitation that we see say, shifting that one in 125-year event to, a, say, a one in 1,000-year event. But the confidence around this uh, conclusion around the 1960s drought is pretty low because of data limitations. It just isn't 1,000 years of observed data in which to, um, and a, enough decadal uh, observations to be able to say with confidence how that 1960s drought may change in the future. All right, so I'm turning now to flood risk. Based on changes in severity and frequency of extreme precipitation, so the idea was looking at daily maximum uh, changes in precipitation for small, flashier watersheds, and changes in five-day maximum for larger watersheds, which can accommodate more rainfall before responding. Again, looking at return periods of 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100 years. Findings suggest that on average, likely to see an increased flood risk in the future by mid-century, and that is driven by more severe and more frequent extreme precipitation expected with an overall increase in the number of days with um, greater than one inch of rain. Daily maximum precipitation is projected to increase more than 50% for all return periods. So just to give, a, again, a sense of what that might look like for the 100-year storm we think about, um, that will become more common. So rather than a one chance every year, might be um, a 2% chance up to a 10% chance each year by mid-century. Moving on to the second part of the climate is what's the implications of these future climate changes for water quality? And this is work that my PhD student, Christina Mullen, did as part of her dissertation. I want to summarize uh, briefly what the implications are for water quality. So what she did is she focused in collaboration with uh, Regional Water Authority, and they have conducted, the Regional Water Authority graciously uh, provided some data for us, and we also worked with uh, Dr. Wang to provide, um, to access the climate data, so the same kinds of climate data that we used before in the analysis I just finished um, discussing were used in this study as well. So what Christina did is she derived lake-specific predictive models for lake temperature and um, thermal stability using a measure of uh, thermal stability called the Relative Thermal Resistance to Mixing, or RTRM. She used daily air temperature and monthly in situ uh, depth profile temperatures for six reservoirs and the downscale daily air temperature projections using, again, the same uh, GCMs, RCT, and uh, MAC metadata that <clears throat> were used in that previous climate analysis. What did she find? Her main conclusions are that reservoir temperatures are expected to increase and that reservoirs, the thermal stability is also expected to increase with the largest temperature increases and greatest increases in thermal stability in those summer months of July and August. And so the two figures that right, the top figure is the temperature, bottom is the thermal stability. In both figures, the reference period is in red the mid-century projections are in blue, and you can see that the blue mid-century projections creep above that red reference period line um, for many months of the year, and then the biggest increases are in those summer months, July and August, even into September. The implications for things like cyanobacteria, algal blooms we might be worried about for the future, Optimum conditions for cyanobacteria, it varies by species. We were looking at uh, microcystin as a one potential species of interest. They tend to like temperatures above 25 degrees. 
and you can see that orange line is about that 25 degree mark. We start to, uh, in the mid-century, kind of sit at or above that uh, 25 degree mark for um, a longer period over the summer months. And so what that suggests is that um, where blooms are already pro a problem, they may become uh, a worse problem in the future. All right, so moving on to the survey results, impacts in response to past storms and droughts. So this part uh, relies on social science research methods, again, surveys and interviews. Steve mentioned um, that we conducted these interviews as part of the um, a large statewide uh, or coastal project that was extended to statewide. We conducted the interviews from 2017 to 2018. These were by phone to about 24 um, systems. We asked them questions about their system, the experience they had with past storms and droughts, and what they did to respond to them. And we tried to have a representative set of systems that we talked with, both coastal, inland, large, small, different water sources, different ownership types. We did the same thing with the survey, um, aiming to get a mix of system sizes, water sources, ownership types, so we could have a fairly representative sample. Uh, the survey was conducted in 2018. It was an online survey, and we had um, a little less than 90 systems respond. Overall, I think we're biased towards um, systems that I don't think that we include a lot of the small systems that had uh, challenges, um, but I think we do see a mix of, of impacts from past storms and droughts. <clears throat> so first of all, for storm impacts, most systems experience some kind of storm impact, but the storm impacts were typically less severe than drought impacts. The most common uh, impact from past storms impacting over two-thirds of systems was power loss. And so with the new regulations for um, generators, we expect that in future storms, we'd see this uh, drop down if we were co to conduct the survey again in the future. Um, over half the systems had to implement an emergency response plan. Some systems had staff uh, that had challenges getting to work, and a few systems experienced flooding. It wasn't very common, and we wouldn't expect it. Uh, for water systems that tend to be up a little bit higher than, for example, wastewater systems. In terms of drought, most systems experience some kind of drought impact. Few really experience severe impacts. So um, in terms of experiencing reduced supply, which is the second item there, about a third of systems experience reduced supply. But you can see with the top that nearly two-thirds experienced or implemented voluntary water restrictions. So while uh, fewer systems experienced actual reductions in supply. There were uh, there was a need to implement water restrictions uh, more broadly. The real severe impacts uh, indicated by having to use an interconnection or boiling, uh, issuing a boil water advisory, in our sample uh, was uh, was fairly infrequent. Interestingly, it seemed in our survey that it was the larger systems um, that had more severe impacts on the drought, so greater exposure to drought than the smaller systems, even though a bunch of systems struggled, as Steve mentioned. <clears throat> on the positive side, most systems felt that their emergency and drought response plans were sufficient, so those that had them felt that, the, uh, that they were, they helped guide them through those storms and droughts in the past. We did see a fair number of systems that conducted post-storm analyses, um, so fewer conducted post-drought analyses. Um, so that may reflect that even though the storm didn't seem like it had that big of an impact, that in fact there was a greater uh, exposure of vulnerability on the storm than on the drought. All right, finally wrapping up, how can systems prepare for future change? Drawing on the survey results, we asked systems what actions they do now that they find most helpful for responding to threats. And as you might imagine, funding, redundancy of supply, different kinds of equipment, generators, remote sensing, SCADA, uh, were all seen as very helpful for responding to storms and droughts now. Uh, in the future, uh, 
also important, I should say, is the human aspect of it with a skilled workforce, communication with customers, and watershed protection. In the future, and by this future we mean about 20 years out, so just at the start of mid-century, redundancy and funding are seen as also very important for the future, as are increased investments in conservation and watershed protection, as well as taking climate action. And so we wanted to dig in a little bit on the climate action piece to understand what systems we're doing now, and then um, to give some uh, insights and guidance on what systems can do if they aren't taking action quite yet. So in terms of what systems are doing now, from the interviews and from the survey, we know that most systems are aware that climate change will bring more frequent severe droughts and storms, but only the higher capacity, the larger systems are really thinking about these changes and beginning to uh, implement them in their strategic plans. Climate change is really not a huge driver or concern across the board. Systems, you know, this is a, an example from one public utility manager that we spoke with. Uh, they said that, you know, it, climate change doesn't really affect them. They're concerned, or they want to say they're concerned, um, but it's just not affecting their water system. In the West, in the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest part of the U.S., even the Southeastern part of the U.S., um, where droughts tend to occur more often, tend to be um, deeper and longer lasting than we experience here in the, in the Northeast. More water systems are undertaking different kinds of approaches to uh, think about climate change and the impacts of their water supplies and water system. One of, there's sort of three main approaches. The first approach is scenario planning. And the idea with scenario planning is that you frame a question. Uh, what's the question that's of concern? What risk do you want to take a look at? You identify then the driving forces, develop the scenarios, evaluate them, and take adaptation actions. And so that is sort of a figure on the right that steps you through what a scenario planning exercise looks like. The nice thing about scenario planning for systems that are really on the very early stages of thinking about uh, climate change and its impacts on, on their water supplies, it's a very flexible approach. It can be very simple. Um, there can be narrative scenarios about what the future climate might hold and tabletop um, conversations about what the implications might, might be for the system to much more complex modeling of climate and um, the system hydrology and system response. Uh, so scenario planning is a very flexible approach. There's a lot of <clears throat> water systems are, are taking advantage of scenario planning. Another common uh, type of approach to incorporating climate change is robust decision making. And this is something that was popularized out of uh, RAND, um, mostly in the West. The idea is that you're using water supply objectives, you know, specific supply availability um, over a, a certain period. You're using performance metrics and you're combining those with modeling to develop a robust set of actions that ensures that you can meet those water supply objectives across different future conditions. And so it's a more complicated um, approach than, scenario, than the more simplified scenario planning approach. It includes more data, it's more data-driven, data-intensive, modeling-intensive uh, than the, uh, the simplest uh, scenario planning is. Um, but it gives you discrete actions that you can take and uh, respond to in a similar way that a drought uh, trigger might implement certain actions, a robust decision-making approach implements certain actions at certain trigger points. <clears throat> And finally, the chain of models approach. This is the most complicated systems like Seattle Public Utilities, Oregon uh, Public Utilities, or Portland um, Water, Denver Water. They use these kinds of chains of models approaches. These are focused specifically on climate change scenario development. They require intense uh, climate modeling, hydro hydrologic modeling, and system modeling coupled together to evaluate potential future impacts of climate change on systems. So it's a very system-specific, very modeling and data-intensive in endeavor. But systems have used this pretty successfully in other parts of the country to take a look at uh, how climate change may impact their individual water supplies. 
Well, that's all I have. Um, thank you very much, uh, Katie. I'm going to pass the controls back over to you. We will have information and reports coming out of these projects that will be posted on CERCA's website uh, in the coming days. Thanks, Christine. Just a reminder, you're going to pass it to John, who's the next presenter. Yep. And, um, you know, we appreciate not only a summary of your research, but others who you've been collaborating with at UConn, especially on the temperature and precipitation projections as related to this topic. Um, a note for everybody on the line, uh, Christine's um, report and some of the products that she's been working on, as well as that report she mentioned from Angie Seth and that team working on the temperature and precipitation results. These are all, uh, we expect to, to have those available and online, um, I would guess, in the next month. Um, they're working hard to incorporate some final edits. And so the, the reports that she mentioned will be sending out through Circa's Resilience Roundup newsletter when they're available, but they definitely contributed a lot to this um, topic and the work that um, Christine just presented. So thank you. Um, we're gonna turn over to John Hudak from the Regional Water Authority, and he's gonna provide some recommendations for how the Regional Water Authority and some water utilities can use some of this information going forward. So John, we can see your screen, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm with the uh, South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority. We're a large regional public and nonprofit drinking water utility. We're based in New Haven. Um, the way I see it, water suppliers in New England tend to be somewhat early in the learning curve for climate change compared to our counterparts out west like Seattle, Portland, and Denver. Um, but like it or not, uh, we've had had to directly confront impacts related to climate change recently. So, not being a climate scientist myself, and like probably some of you, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around the science. Um, so I, I prepared these takeaways. I did not see Christine's slides before I prepared mine, so I'm really glad to see that these agree. Um, but very simply, on average, uh, we will get more rain year-round in Connecticut. Um, However, this rain is going to come in fewer and higher intensity rain events. Um, more rain will not necessarily mean we're safe from droughts. Uh, increased climate flashiness and evapotranspiration are predicted to increase the frequency of short-term droughts. Uh, as Christine mentioned, somewhat significant for water supply planners, uh, none of the modeling done by UConn gave reason to conclude that longer duration multi-year droughts such as in the 1960s will become more frequent. So absent a further study, uh, I think continuing to use the 1960s drought as a basis for safe yield modeling and worst case drought planning uh, seems to be a reasonable and conservative approach. So anyone who thinks uh, these climate Forecasts are merely educated speculation. Uh, you may want to look back at what's happened over the last 10 years. Uh, this is a graph of the annualized 107-year record of daily precipitation measurements uh, at our Lake Whitney Dam in Hampton, Connecticut. Uh, it does show a slight increasing trend in precipitation over that time, but what's really noticeable here is the variability in the last few decades. Um, and particularly uh, looking at the, the 2008 through 2011 period. Uh, 2008, we actually had our, uh, our highest annual precipitation in that period of record of 72 inches. The next year, uh, the third highest at 66 inches. Uh, two years later, the fifth highest in 2011 at 61 inches. And I can add that 2018 surpassed uh, 2011 in a number five slot with 62 inches. So, uh, it really appears things are getting wetter. Going further, uh, we have been living through some atypical extreme weather in, in recent years. Um, early 2011, if you remember, was marked by successive frequent and heavy snowfalls that led to an epidemic of roof collapses that we've never experienced. 
Uh, in August of 2011, we had Hurricane Irene, heavy rain, winds, three to five foot storm surge, uh, greater than 800,000 outages in Connecticut for days, and $200 million worth of damage. Almost to the day, two months later, the, the infamous Holly, Halloween leaf on snowstorm where the weight of the snow toppled trees all over the state. Over half the state was without power for up to 10 days. So that was really uh, kind of a double whammy uh, in 2011. Exactly one year later, uh, Hurricane Sandy, a beast of a storm on the East Coast, uh, greater than nine foot storm surge, over 600,000 outages, $360 million in damage. A few months later, February 2013, a massive snowstorm that left 30 to 40 inches in the New Haven area. Roads were impassable for days. Um, I do try to slip my dog Humphrey in all my presentations, by the way. And more recently, uh, March 2018, uh, nor'easters seem to occur every Wednesday. Uh, this, this is a, a photo of, um, of my driveway uh, in, in mid-March, and where a tree fell one night, uh, about 10 seconds after my son were standing in this very spot shoveling snow, uh, took out power to my entire neighborhood, snapped the utility pole in half. Uh, no, not only was I without power, but uh, I was unable to commute to work until the trees and wires were safely removed a couple of days later. So what happened in those years when it wasn't wet and stormy? Um, here's a couple of images uh, from the European satellite known as Sentinel-2. Uh, the red circled water bodies make up the Regional Water Authority's largest uh, reservoir system. From left to right, you have Lake Gillard in North Brantford, Lake Monunkatuck in Guilford, and Lake Hammonasset in Madison and Killingworth. Uh, the top image shows what these reservoirs looked like in November 2017, under uh, you know, a little higher but close to normal storage conditions. Compare that to the bottom image a year or earlier, in November 2016, uh, you can see areas of um, dry lake bottom in Lake Lard, including a land bridge to the center island, and the two eastern reservoirs have all but disappeared. Uh, by the end of November 2016, this system was at 43% capacity. Uh, these were water levels for this system that were unprecedented. And many water systems statewide were in dire need of rain, which fortunately came in 2017. So climate change is just one of many future and uncertain risks and challenges keeping utility managers up at, at night. Uh, just to name a few, there are new state stream flow regulations coming down the line, an aging workforce, emerging contaminants, and declining water demand affecting revenue. So selection of climate adaptations really needs to be a process integrated and evaluated along with other future uncertainties. Uh, one thing really not part of uh, this work, but still very important to some systems is sea level rise. Uh, for coastal water systems, um, this can be a very important issue. Uh, sea level rise projections for coastal Connecticut in 2100 range from one to four feet. Our headquarters in New Haven is in the FEMA flood zone. Uh, vulnerabilities include flood damage uh, and or limitations on the ability to travel to and access uh, this facility and other facilities that might be along the coastal areas. Iron water mains in coastal areas are susceptible to corrosion if they become exposed to tidal water, so it may be a call for alternative um, pipe materials. Water quality could be adversely affected by too little or too much water and warmer temperatures. Um, extreme storm events can cause flashy water quality and high turbidity that can disrupt treatment chemical dosing and filtration. A longer growing season and longer periods of reservoir thermal stratification that Christine pointed out uh, could promote changes in seasonal phytoplankton species succession and favor undesirable species like cyanobacteria. Uh, this can impact filtration, cause taste and odor problems, or release toxins. More pronounced and longer 
Thermal stratification promotes low dissolved oxygen and reservoir bottom waters. Uh, this can result in sediment release of phosphorus that can fuel more algae blooms and also uh, manganese. So all of these changes can increase the probability of uh, increased treatment costs, customer complaints, and even regulatory violations. For distribution system components, including water tanks, warming temperatures coupled with aging water from the ongoing declines in customer demand are even now contributing to difficulties in meeting limits for disinfection byproducts and maintaining adequate chlorine residual concentrations in the system. As noted earlier, short-term droughts are expected to become more frequent and severe. So this raises a lot of questions. Do water systems drought response triggers need to be revisited? What might be the effects on water demands, including outdoor water use? Are we to expect more conflicts between water supply and ecological needs? And finally, uh, what might be the combined effects of climate change and implementation of the new stream flow regulations around uh, mid, in the mid-2020s? Uh, this will require more water to be released downstream to maintain aquatic habitats, and this will have, uh, an, in many areas, lower reservoir water levels. Another area of concern is dam safety. Um, with the frequency and mag magnitude of storm events trending upward, will dams need to be upgraded to pass higher storm flows? Uh, these are some photos of our Lake Whitney Dam in Hamden, constructed by Eli Whitney Jr. way back in 1860. Photos on the right are from April 2007 during a rain event that dumped about five inches of rain in two days. The photo on the bottom left, uh, this is the epic storm in Connecticut for baby boomers like me. Uh, this is from June 6, 1982, also known as the June 1982 flood, looking downstream at the Mill River from the Lake Whitney Dam. This storm totaled about a foot of rain over three days. Uh, the red covered bridge that you see in the bottom right in 2007, um, if you looked at the June 82 photo there, <clears throat> you can actually see water flowing through the windows of the bridge. Uh, fortunately, the dam held up, and in preparation for more floods like this, uh, we're now planning a major re uh, dam rehabilitation project. A warming climate could have major implications for watershed forests that serve to protect water quality, retain runoff, and also can generate revenue from timber sales. Our forests are not wanting for insect pests that prefer water warmer climates. Uh, in 2017, the RWA removed hundreds of spruce trees, upwards of 100 years old, surrounding a reserve reservoir and popular recreation area in West Haven that had been infested with the southern pine beetle. Uh, this is a native southern species that has slowly been expanding its range northward in recent years. Uh, there's also concerns that high value northern species uh, will diminish, including northern red oak and sugar maples, um, which are more desirable and marketable trees. And extreme storms can be devastating to the forest's ability to function as natural filters for drinking water sources and tree damage creates hazards for employees, recreational users, and neighboring properties. Extreme weather events like uh, those I mentioned will continue to present a multitude of operational and logistical problems for water utilities. Uh, these disruptions include power outages that can affect treatment plants and pump station operations, uh, can limit uh, access of facilities from flooding, tree damage, and snow um, can also limit the uh, availability or ability to get fuel for emergency generators or fleet vehicles, uh, creates outdoor conditions unsafe for field employees, and uh, like me in that March Nor'easter, limits the ability of employees to report to work. Also, communication systems that we tend to rely on, like cellular systems and the internet, may be Come temporarily unavailable. So 
I think um, you know we're getting close to wrapping up, but in, uh, I want to leave some parting thoughts. Um, preparing for climate change is really not just a, a one-off, but it's in large part I view as an integration with the types of planning water utilities have been doing for many years. Um, here's some strategies for adapting to climate change. Um, integrating climate change into all aspects of future planning, including water supply, emergency response, business continuity, capital planning, and employee training. Uh, consider climate change as one of the many uncertainties involved with preparing for the future. Uh, metrics on any one risk may be, can be pulled in, in different directions by different factors. You know, for example, if you take uh, customer water demand, in addition to a change in climate, it's affected by population changes, um, wet or dry summers, the economy, social norms, and innovation, innovations in water use efficiency. When assessing alternatives for climate adaptation, I think it's best to proceed with those that have co-benefits, um, also called no regret strategies. Uh, many of the actions we undertake for climate change can have multiple benefits. Um, like Christine alluded to, uh, we kind of need to go beyond traditional methods and assumptions to forecast future conditions. It's really about scenario planning, actively monitoring what's happening as time goes on, and preparing for a range of possible futures. For example, a 50-year demand forecast that follows a single straight line is really guaranteed to be wrong, and it's bound to lead to bad decisions. And finally, going beyond adaptations, I, I like to think water suppliers can be part of the climate crisis solution. Uh, large amounts of energy are used to treat and deliver water. The state has a goal of achieving a 45% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. Uh, water providers are facing many financial challenges and are looking to reduce their energy costs, including converting to renewables. Uh, so there's tremendous opportunity here, I think, for water and electric utilities, environmentalists, and regulatory agencies to work together uh, to come overcome whatever barriers uh, might be in place to address carbon emissions from the water sector and benefit water ratepayers. Um, with that final thought, I think my 15 minutes of fame are up, and uh, I'll hand things back to Katie for the uh, Q&A portion. Thanks, John. Um, it was great to have some of the perspective from a, a, the region as well as, you know, to follow up from some of Christine's research at a more macro level and, and Stephen's at the state scale. Um, so we do have time for a few questions. You can type them into the chat box that I mentioned. We, we don't have any questions yet that I see, although that's maybe a reflection of the 35 people on the line on a summer Friday, but we'll wait here for a few minutes. Um, Christine, maybe I can start by asking you to um, explain a, a little bit about the guidance document. I know it's not finalized yet, but I think you're pretty close to having some um, uh, final product in terms of the, the guidance documents that you've developed based on some of these case studies, I think, that you've looked at um, in the region, too, as well as uh, region meaning Northeast, but also across the country. And so I think that that's going to be a really helpful product that um, is going to be available from your work, as well as, of course, all the research results that you talked about. But can you describe that in a little detail for those that are on the line who might be interested? Yeah, sure. So we are, um, we're, we've gotten some feedback from our partners, the uh, uh, COG and the Regional Water Authority, to try and um, make sure that the document is as useful as possible, but the idea is to take what I presented, the few, you know, the three different approaches that I presented uh, and step through those approaches, the scenario planning, the robust decision making, and chain of models, um, step through example, real world examples of what it looks like in practice so that it becomes less abstract, you know, what, you know, what scenario is planning is this, you know, views of the future, blah, 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 but by looking at specific, uh, you know, like, for example, what Denver Waters approach to scenario planning look like, looks like, or um, um, what Seattle Public Utilities uh, process of using a chain of models approach looks like in practice. So um, utilities can get a better sense of 
uh, what exactly is involved and what utility is gained by um, putting uh, the investment into those different approaches. Um, and the kinds, I mean, I think another important aspect of that is the kinds of questions that utilities were asking and uh, the approaches they used to get at uh, those questions. And does that help? Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to think of um, kind of some of the products coming from this that are going to be really helpful, kind of practical, uh, you know, things that decision makers can can use moving forward, um, which John touched on some of that as well. But, um, well, we don't have any, oh, here's one question that just came in. How does the business continuity plan differ from an emergency response plan? Um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, there, there's definitely crossovers. I like the, the Water Authority actually has <clears throat> an incident management plan, um, <clears throat> which is um, more broader in nature, can be applied to any situation, uh, defines roles. Um, our business continuity plan is, um, you know, you can have different kinds, but ours is very specific. Um, we have a we have a plan actually for our headquarters in New Haven as to what we do if our headquarters, which is, um, you know, it's very important to us for, for our operation, goes down, we can't access it. Um, so we, if we temporarily lose our, that facility for weeks or months, we actually have a plan in place to operate uh, from another location. Um, so it, it is just a, a very specific um, plan. It, it, we, we, we budget for things we need to do, we exercise it, we do tabletops, um, while the the emergency plan or incident management plan, which is based on the um, incident command system that fire departments and, and police departments and, and other emergency uh, agencies use can be applied to any situation. Okay, thank you, John, for that um, insight. And looks like we have another one that just came in. It's a little bit longer, so I'm just reading it here so I can offer it. Um, someone's working in Texas for um, water and other planning, but it's quite expensive. He's thinking about uh, jump-starting some of the analysis. What are the experiences of the panelists in finding innovative funding, which I'm sure is a question that comes up for a lot of um, climate, implementing climate projects. But are, does anyone have insight in terms of finding funding to address some of these concerns? Um, for us, so far, it's been um, using uh, using our, our rate rates and revenue at this time. So we haven't really searched for additional funding other than the the uh, amount we use for this project. Yeah, and Circa, Circa also has a, um, a reference that we can share with you about um, financing some different types of resiliency projects. Um, so we can share that as well. But and We um, have used um, the uh, single revolving loan fund um, that DPH administers for, for various projects. Um, for example, uh, we're we're putting in an, an advanced metering infrastructure, which actually will um, allow us to, and our customers to see real-time water demand and help with monthly billing. So, you know, in, in that case, that is somewhat of a climate adaptation in itself, in the fact that we don't have to um, rely on on manual meter reads and people going out in bad weather or whatever to uh, um, to collect this data. And um, I would second the um, revolving funds. There's typically more and more states have set aside for climate. I don't know if Texas does, the Texas you know, Department of Environmental Quality or um, I forget the, the, their name now, may have, I'm sure they're the ones that administer it and may have um, set asides for climate. The other um, Texas Water Development Board, if it's a more rural uh, system, sometimes has funding. And then if it's climate specific work, um, you could look at uh, some of the regional climate centers um, or NOAA if you're interested in partnering 
uh, with climate scientists that are more local. Um, you know, sometimes there's funding available for partnerships that could fund the research side of it, and then the, and you bring the real world, um, you know, experience and system specific knowledge to that collaboration. And um, I know there are climate centers that cover the south, um, uh, the south uh, west or, or Texas area. There's a um, NOAA RISA program that is headquartered in Oklahoma that covers Texas, and that. Uh, particular program, um, their, their mission is to uh, work with different stakeholders on uh, climate adaptation, so that could be a, a potential resource. That's great, Christine. Thanks, because that's why it's helpful to have your perspective on some of the other things happening across the country, too. Um, well, it's at the top of the hour, so um, we're going to close the webinar. Um, I hope you all gain some perspective um, from the state uh, to a regional level on this important topic of climate impacts on drinking water, um, and that you learned about some of the new concerns, research, and products available, uh, as well as how they can be used by the water utilities and the other decision makers. So um, I want to let you all know that our next Resilient Connecticut webinar is going to be July 23rd at 11 a.m., and it's focused on translating technical tools to planning for sea level rise. Um, we're going to have some uh, a demo of, of a new sea level rise map tool um, as part of that webinar, and you can read a little bit more about it in the announcements section of our Resilient Connecticut um, website. So a reminder to visit that website and sign up for our Resilience um, Roundup newsletter that goes out monthly to explain some of these events. Um, thank you for uh, the speakers today for your great presentations. Um, and your time on, a, on this summer Friday, and to all of you for joining. Um, so we'll, I'll be following up with those that registered with some of the great information that was presented today, and we'll be in touch with some of these products that were mentioned here in the future. So thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.